So thanks for joining us today for the PNAM Remote Sensing Forum. If we haven't met, my name is Amy Poles and I work for the USGS and the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAP for short. And as always, I am joined by Lauren Burns. Hi, as Amy mentioned, I'm Lauren Burns. I'm a fishery scientist with EcoFish Research. Amy and I co-lead the forum and we will be co-facilitating today's meeting. All right, so before we get started, just a couple of tips uh, on navigating the Teams meeting platform. I think most of us are pretty used to this by now, but just in case, um, we do love to see and hear from you. Uh, but when you aren't speaking, please make sure your camera and mic are off. That will help keep the meeting running smoothly. Uh, to do this, uh, you use icons on the Teams toolbar, and depending on the version you're using, that might be fixed at the top right of your meeting window, or you might need to hover your mouse to get it to appear near the bottom middle of the meeting window. If you're on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. We invite you, use, <clears throat> invite you to use the chat at any time. Uh, we'll respond to technical issues the best we can, and we will circle back to questions for the speakers during the Q&A. And when we get to the Q&A, we're also gonna encourage you to ask questions out loud, and you can use the raise hand icon on the toolbar, and we'll call on you to unmute yourself. So just a quick look at today's agenda. Uh, after I wrap up the welcome, uh, we'll have a couple of forum updates. After that, we'll have two presentations that I'm very excited about, and I'm sure you're all excited about, that's why we're here. Um, we'll have time for questions immediately following each presentation. And then at the end, we'll open it up for further questions and discussion uh, if folks are interested. So we are excited to have you all here today. Uh, we really want this to be an open and welcoming environment and a harassment-free experience for everyone. So we just ask that you please be respectful in your interactions. And I think that's good advice in most situations and it is required here. This is just a quick reminder that we meet quarterly. And so our next and final meeting of 2023 will be in October. Uh, the Remote Sensing Forum Organizing Committee is in the process of putting together a panel discussion for the next meeting uh, focused on drone policies and regulations across federal, tribal, and state lands. That's the idea anyway. Uh, we'll let you know the details once that comes together. And if you know of someone you think would be a good fit for the panel, uh, feel free to send us their contact information. And then if anyone out there is interested in serving on the RSF Organizing Committee, uh, feel free to reach out to Lauren and me. Uh, we have a couple of folks departing and we're looking for some new members. If this is your first meeting, um, you should also reach out to me if you wanna be added to the distribution list so you can get uh, meeting information sent directly to you. All right, the last time we met, we talked about different ways that RSF members could share resources and other remote sensing information. And we agreed that we were going to give Google Groups a try. So I've been doing a little testing since then and found that sending the system uh, generated invitations is just not really going to work. So if you want to opt into the group, I'm going to need to directly add your email address. Um, but I'm not going to assume that all of you want to be added. So I'm going to send an email with instructions and a sign up form. Um, if you don't want to be part of the group, you don't have to do anything. If you do want to be part of it, uh, you'll fill out the online form with your name, the email address that you want to use to send and receive the group emails, and that can be any email address. It doesn't need to be a Gmail address, uh, and you'll indicate your subscription preference, which is just how you how you get the emails, either each one individually, a daily digest, or an abridged digest. And like I said, I'm going to send an email. It'll have all the details on how it works and how to opt in. So hopefully that goes out uh, with the link to the to today's recording, um, and that should be in the next day or two. So I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, we're hoping that this is an easy way for you all to share information, and we hope that you find it useful. So that is it for updates. Are there any questions? I don't see any raised hands, and I don't see anything in the chat. All right, so then I am going to pass it over to Lauren. Thanks, Amy. Um, so we like to include a little primer slide uh, prior to launching into the presentations. 
So today's speakers will be focusing on aquatic remote sensing, which we all know, um, in both near shore, near shore and wetland environments, and the unique challenges that those environments pose for planning, collecting, and summarizing data. In advance of their presentations, we wanted to quickly review some core concepts of remote, ser remote sensing to serve as reference for today's audience and also for future viewers watching this video at a later date. Um, so um, just launching into a figure that I borrowed from a 2022 publication. It summarizes the temporal, res temporal resolution of remote sensing for both you know, satellite and drone based uh, data collection. Um, so here you can see satellites circling the Earth with a small drone that might be collecting data closer to the Earth. Um, zooming further in, uh, you can see that uh, the temporal resolution of satellites is the return interval for a sensor, which is the time it takes for the sensor to return to the exact same location. Um, and for drones, uh, this is a bit more nuanced. It, it's dependent on the user, that's operating the drone and conducting the flight based on their schedule, their timing, and weather requirements. The spatial resolution, on the other hand, is the size of the minimum area that can be identified by a sensor, uh, which is generally reported as the pixel size of an image. And this is pretty standard across both satellite and drone-based remote sensing applications. Uh, next, we'll go into the spectral resolution, which is um, both the width, location, um, and spectral wavelength bands that are detectable by a given sensor. And especially in near shore and wetland environments, this is challenging for a, a variety of reasons related to water clarity and um, things that our speakers will get into in more, more detail today. Um, and finally, radiometric resolution, which is the sensitivity of a given sensor to measure differences in the reflected or emitted energy. And so commonly, um, the types of data analyses that you see um, for sensors collecting remotely sensed data, uh, we are, they return rasters, which are composed of pixels. Um, and individual analyses typically are pixel-based classifications or object-based classifications. And you may have heard of these as supervised or unsupervised classifications or OBIA classification schemes for short. So that's just a quick primer and um, something that we wanted to document for future users that we've never never really compiled all in one place. Uh, so hopefully this serves as a, a reference for today to flip back to um, and for future viewers. And with that, um, we're going to go into a quick Slido poll. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, we like to do these live polling questions. Um, so if you raise your camera and click on the QR link, um, please answer the following question, and I'll be um, watching the watching the results come in. So today's question is coming from Natasha Nahirnik. Uh, have you ever been involved with mission planning and data collection of aerial photography, satellite imagery, or submerged habitat? Great. Have a couple answers coming in. Um, majority yes so far. From six participants, 50-50. Yeah, and again, these these questions just help inform our speakers of you know the audience knowledge base um, and what level of detail they might go into for their presentation. So we really appreciate the responses. All right, majority no. All right, uh, hopefully that's good. That's good context, Natasha. Um, as you as you think about your audience for today, so let's let's launch into our first present, uh, presenter for today. I am so pleased to welcome Natasha Nahirnik, who um, I work with at EcoFish Research, and she's going to be presenting today on mapping with confidence, delineating seagrass habitats using remotely piloted aerial systems. And take it away. Thanks, Lauren. Just give me a moment to get this on. Can you see my presentation? That's great. Nice. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Yep. As uh, as Lauren mentioned, my name is Natasha. I work at Ecofish Research as an environmental scientist and geomatic specialist. 
so I work a lot with mapping eelgrass, kelp and salt marsh habitats and more recently have started applying that into freshwater wetland habitats. So today we're going to be talking about um, how to collect imagery of through water uh, habitats, particularly eelgrass, uh, with drones or remotely piloted aerial systems. Now, today, this is actually some work that I completed a few years ago um, during, it was like a side project in grad school. Um, so it was a partnership between the University of Victoria's Spectral and Remote Sensing Lab, uh, the Hakai Institute, and Parks Canada. So I've thrown up our, our citation there if you want to check us out in the Remote Sensing in Ecology and Conservation. This is an open access journal, so read away. Um, you'll notice that I've changed the title slightly. We used to call them Unoccupied Aerial Systems before Canada had a official name to call drones. So now we were calling them Remotely Piloted Aerial Systems. So what is eelgrass? Eelgrass is a perennial flowering marine grass growing in soft sand and mud substrates, and it grows both in intertidal and subtidal areas. Um, so maximum biomass hits in June to August, so that's usually when we're trying to image these habitats. Um, and they also reproduce both through root division as well as seed production. Why do we care about mapping eelgrass meadows? Uh, well, they are highly productive and diverse ecosystems, which form a keystone component of estuarine and nearshore food webs. They are critical habitat for a variety of organisms, and particularly in my case, I care about the early marine survival of juvenile salmon. So as they're leaving their natal streams, eelgrass meadows are an extremely important habitat to provide cover and food opportunities for juvenile salmon. Eelgrass also has um, a number of valuable ecological functions such as substrate stabilization and pollutant filtration, as well as protecting shorelines against wave energy and currents. So why would we want to use remotely piloted aerial systems or drones for eelgrass mapping? Well, all the same reasons why everybody uses drones for everything else. Uh, you have extremely flexible timing for image acquisition. You have relatively inexpensive costs associated with it compared to tasking uh, an airplane or a high resolution satellite. And you get very, very high spatial resolution imagery, which really helps when you're trying to differentiate between eelgrass, which has you know, one type of texture, and algae, which will have a different type of texture, though they may be very similar uh, in spectral uh, properties. However, seal seagrass habitats, particularly in temperate regions of BC, um, as well as other areas of the Pacific Northwest, are subject to a variety of factors that influence the quality of the imagery for mapping. And these could be uh, the dynamic interplay of tides and cloud cover and ever-changing water column turbidity. You also have very complex ecosystems um, where the seagrass habitats are going to range in uh, density and the patchiness of those meadows, uh, as well as the depth profile. So you could have eelgrass um, in the intertidal zone growing down into the subtidal. You can have different substrate types and you can have uh, the presence of other uh, submerged aquatic vegetation that is not eelgrass, um, thereby confusing your classification processes. So we're going to go through a few uh, thought-provoking images um, just to show you the differences between um, a few different parameters um, before we actually launch into the methods um, of, the, of the work itself. So here's an image just demonstrating the difference in tide height um, and how that can impact your imagery. So you can see the eelgrass meadow is growing from, it's in the upper right hand corner of the image, kind of growing down in a little bit of a peninsula. And on the left hand side, you have a 2.2 meter tide and on the right, you have a 1.2 meter tide. And it makes a, a pretty big difference in terms of the contrast between your background sediments and your eelgrass. 
Sun angle is another big one. So if the sun is too high in the sky, you'll start getting sun glint, um, as opposed to the image on the right with a lower sun angle and no sun glint. Cloud cover is a big one here in BC and other temperate regions. Cloud cover is a way of life. Um, so on the left, you can see that uh, cloud cover is going to create some pretty intense uh, and uh, inconsistent cloud reflectance across your imagery. And turbidity. So this image was taken, um, these images were taken at the same location, but two days later, um, one during an algae bloom, and uh, two days later, once the bloom had cleared. And you can see uh, <laughs> on the left, you are unable to locate the eelgrass meadow. And there are a number of factors that are going to influence uh, site specifics. So eelgrass can be described as continuous, continuous with patches or patchy. So you can imagine that imaging a continuous meadow is going to be much easier than imaging a patchy meadow. Um, as is demonstrated by a few photos here, we have a continuous meadow um, where you can imagine if you had a um, an ortho mosaic of this meadow, it'd be pretty easy to delineate the boundaries. Even same with this meadow where we have continuous with patches. That one, you can imagine yourself delineating those boundaries pretty okay. Then you get into patchy meadows and you start wondering, what is any of this? Um, and of, like in this example, we're also dealing with a fair amount of algae um, accumulation as well. And then the eelgrass meadow can come in a range of densities as well. So on our left, we have a dense eelgrass meadow. On the right, there's a sparse eelgrass meadow. Um, so common sense indicates, you know, a denser eelgrass meadow is going to be easier to map than a sparse eelgrass meadow. And then we get into all of the special things that could be in that eelgrass meadow uh, that are not eelgrass, uh, thereby confusing uh, our classifiers. So uh, here in BC, as elsewhere, we have brown algaes, red algaes, green algaes, um, and typically your green algae is going to be the, the most confusing for any classifier trying to separate out eelgrass. And then finally, how deep is the eelgrass actually growing? Um, so the deeper the eelgrass, the more water column is between the eelgrass and your sensor. So all of those water column parameters are going to compound um, across uh, the deeper your eelgrass is going. Um, this is a figure that I borrowed from uh, previous work in my graduate lab. Um, that looked at the different spectral separabilities of eelgrass and other um, cover types that you typically find. Um, and so deep eelgrass is spectrally separable from deep sand, but it's not spectrally separable from deep water. So if the eelgrass is growing at a depth at which light cannot penetrate to illuminate that substrate, um, that deep sand, then eelgrass cannot be separated from deep water. So at this point, we now have this sort of collection of environmental conditions and site characteristics that we believe are impacting our ability to map eelgrass. Um, so in terms of environmental conditions, we have sun angle, tidal height, the secchi depth, uh, the wind speed, and the cloud cover. Um, I forgot to mention this, but if you are not familiar with what a secchi depth is, it's a disk with um, white and black checkers and we lower it into the water until you can't see it uh, and measure that depth and so that gives you uh, an estimate of the depth of light penetration into the water column and then we have the site characteristics which include the density and patchiness of eelgrass the amount of non-eelgrass vegetation present the substrate tone and its contrast with eelgrass the depth of that eelgrass deep edge. And then we've also included the exposure of the site to wind and current um, because this will um, theoretically impact um, the, particularly the, the wind impacts at the site. So we asked ourselves the question, which of these factors are most important for collecting high quality through water imagery of submerged eelgrass habitats using drones? We know they're all playing a part, 
but which things are most important and are there actual relationships that we can pick out um, along the way. So in order to investigate this, we uh, had 26 study sites across four regions of BC. So it included um, up in the north in Guayanas, um, on the central coast around Calvert Island where the Hakai Field Station is. Um, we had some sites down in the Broken Group in Clayquot Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island and uh, a few sites in the Gulf Islands near Victoria, which is the provincial capital. At each of these sites, we collected um, drone imagery using a DJI Phantom 3 Pro, using automated flight planning at an altitude of 80 to 100 meters, depending on how large the site was. And at each of these sites, we recorded information to provide those environmental conditions that we talked about earlier. We then also collected towed video reference data. So um, we used a differential GPS um, and tracked our location as we towed the uh, camera underwater, collecting um, video of the eelgrass meadow. So this helped us determine, as you can see on the uh, map on your right, uh, the red points. I'm so sorry if there's anyone colorblind in this in this presentation. The red points. Um, um, which you can see starting out here, indicate no eelgrass. So this is helping us identify where that deep edge is and uh, you know, how separable that eelgrass is from the background substrates behind it. Um, and so this, uh, these data provided us um, the site characteristics of eelgrass density and patchiness. Uh, the density of non-eelgrass submerged aquatic vegetation, as well as an indication of the substrate tone at this site. So for our actual mapping process, we used a combination of object-based image analysis to perform the image segmentation. Um, so here you can see the original image on the left um, after the image has been segmented on the right. And we combine that with a manual classification process. So we come along and use the, the paintbrush tool in eCognition. Um, and uh, essentially, it's like you're painting the eelgrass meadow onto your uh, object segments. Um, so it is essentially a manual visual uh, photo interpretation, uh, but you're allowing the object-based segmentation to draw the lines for you. Um, so we'd end up with these these really beautifully detailed uh, eelgrass maps, um, as you can see on the right. So then the final uh, piece of the puzzle um, in terms of those uh, parameters that we already talked about is the depth of the eelgrass deep edge. So to produce that, we did a simple zonal statistics on that eelgrass polygon. Um, using a bathymetric raster. Um, so in this case, the minimum value of that raster intersecting the eelgrass polygon is minus six. So the deep edge of this eelgrass meadow is uh, minus six meters below chart datum. Now, we then asked ourselves the question, because it's not just the tidal height, or not just the secchi, not just the depth of the eelgrass deep edge, um, but how deep beyond the eelgrass deep edge should you theoretically be able to image given the tidal height and the water clarity conditions? So we came up with uh, a parameter that we called theoretical visibility, which took the eelgrass deep edge and combined it with the tidal height and the secchi depth to produce a value that indicates um, how, how much more beyond that eelgrass deep edge should you be able to see. So in this case, um, with a deep edge of minus 2.5 meters below chart datum, with a 0 0.6 meter tide above chart datum, and a 3.5 meter secchi depth, we should be able to see that eelgrass deep edge plus about 0 0.4 meters of additional depth beyond it. Now, finally, how did we actually uh, determine how hard it was. <laughs> um, so we 
de developed a uh, ranking system which we called confidence levels, um, which described how hard it was to map that eelgrass. Um, so high confidence mapping sites had eelgrass that was easy to map with very little confusion between eelgrass and other vegetation or background sediments. Um, medium confidence had some difficulties uh, in those areas and low confidence sites were quite difficult to map the eelgrass in a large portion of the site. And this was usually um, particularly evident at the eelgrass deep edge where the water column is uh, the, uh, the greatest. And there would have been a lot of confusion between eelgrass and other um, vegetation or background sediments. So, <clears throat> so here's just a couple examples. This would be, excuse me, a high confidence site where you have, uh, you can imagine drawing that line around the eelgrass meadow where you see. Um, the green points coming to the deep edge. This one's pretty easy. You can kind of tell exactly where the eelgrass is. Same with this one. Um, we don't have a lot of surface effects. You can, you can see pretty clearly where the eelgrass starts and ends versus a low confidence site. So this site has lots of surface effects. You cannot really tell where that deep edge is. Um, you see that the eelgrass itself is quite patchy um, and there's a lot of other uh, vegetation present at this site. And here's another low confidence site, but sort of a different, um, a different style. Um, we have, um, really beautiful surface conditions and good water clarity conditions, but very high levels of other um, other vegetation on site. Um, so it's it's quite difficult to actually delineate where the edges of this particular meadow is. So now for each site, we have a confidence level. We have data for five environmental conditions at the time of image acquisition. We have data for five site characteristics, which are independent of those environmental conditions. And we have data for that one additional environmental plus site combination variable. So we can look at these individual variables in relation to confidence level. Um, and we can also conduct multivariate analysis to determine which of those variables are most important. Now, I must warn you, I did not do the statistics on this. This would be my very talented colleagues over at the uh, Hakai Institute. So if you have uh, statistics questions, I will humbly pass your questions on um, to my friends at Hakai. <laughs> um, but I will try my best to explain um, and more focus on um, the, the practical um, examples of what this looked like in the field. So um, multivariate statistics were conducted to see um, which ones of these parameters uh, best explained those confidence levels. So here we have um, the top six plus the cloud cover um, as both a linear relationship as well as a quadratic relationship. Um, our top uh, variable explaining confidence level turned out to be sun angle with uh, theoretical visibility following very close behind it. Um, so I'll take you through some examples of what this looked like. So our top variable being sun angle. Um, there are some recommendations in the literature in terms of sun angle um, and uh, and for imaging through water habitats, that being um, a, an awesome guidance document by Finkbeiner et al. from 2001, recommending sun angles between 15 to 45 degrees. Now, this is the minimum amount of light that they say is required in order to illuminate the substrate, um, as well as the maximum angle before sun glint occurs. So what did we find happening to the mapping confidence when the sun angle um, was outside the recommended values? 
So we found that high confidence mapping in these eelgrass habitats can occur with sun angles as low as six degrees. Um, and of course, that's going to be dependent on um, those site specific characteristics of the eelgrass as well and the other factors that are going to impact your through water visibility. Um, however, we also appear to max out at about 40 degrees for confident mapping. And this is this is a bit of a threshold that I've I've witnessed um, since then working in eelgrass habitats that, you know, once you hit 40 degrees, you should probably stop. Um, I would not push it up to 45. So theoretical visibility was the second top variable. Uh, on the left, we have an image from a site with a minus 1.1 meter theoretical visibility compared to a site where um, you have ample visibility. Um, so what happens to that mapping confidence when our theoretical visibility is decreased? Well, we've figured out that as you might expect, your theoretical visibility must be positive for confident mapping. Um, we don't have any higher medium confidence mapping uh, where that theoretical visibility is a negative value. The third variable was eelgrass density and patchiness. On the left, we have a sparse and patchy eelgrass meadow where it's much harder to delineate the boundaries. Um, as opposed to a dense and continuous meadow on the right. So how does this variable impact our mapping confidence? Well, you can see that um, our high confidence sites don't have any sparse um, patchy eelgrass um, sites. Uh, None of the sparse patchy eelgrass sites were highly confidently mapped. Um, and then as the medium and low confidence sites, uh, you get increasing patchy and sparse um, sites. Wind speed was the fourth variable. Um, you can see a site with wind ripples on the left and a site without wind ripples on the right. Um, and as you can see, the um, highest confidence maps had uh, wind speeds below eight kilometers an hour, which was also something that we, we tested as well. We wanted to figure out um, what was the threshold for wind ripple um, production, and it did turn out to be at about eight kilometers. Um, so once you do get wind ripples, your mapping confidence does start to drop off. And then cloud cover. So here we have three examples. We have a less than 10% cloud cover, a 50%, and a 100%. So it turns out that that quadratic model fit better than the linear model. So your best conditions are going to be either very little cloud cover or total cloud cover. And that's going to provide you at least consistent cloud reflection and surface effects, um, which can be easier uh, to enhance as opposed to um, these patchy situations where if you try to enhance that, you're going to get inconsistent enhancement um, across the image. And then finally, the sixth variable was non-eelgrass. Um, submerged aquatic vegetation mixing. Um, and similarly, um, though not as pronounced, we do have a higher proportion of only eelgrass um, and some non-eelgrass vegetation in those high and medium um, mapping confidence sites uh, and a smaller proportion of only eelgrass in that low uh, confidence sites. Here are just a few uh, little comparisons to take a look at, optimal conditions versus poor conditions. Um, so that first one is a good sun angle versus a bad sun angle. Uh, the second row is good visibility versus poor theoretical visibility. That top left is looking at a site that just has eelgrass versus a site that has um, lots of other vegetation. You can see um, that contrast between what's inside the polygon and outside the polygon um, is uh, much less contrast in the in the high vegetation uh, example. 
Below it, we have cloud cover. So on our left, we have 100% cloud cover. It's actually quite easy to enhance that and see the eelgrass um, fairly clearly. And on the right, we have that 50% cloud cover where you get that striping of, of cloud reflectance across the imagery. And finally, you have an example of wind speed uh, with one on the left with a nice glass-like surface um, and on the uh, right where that deeper eelgrass becomes quite hard to pick out. So in conclusion, uh, we determine the most important variables for getting really good through water imagery of eelgrass habitats are sun angle and theoretical visibility. If the sun is greater than 40, 40 degrees in altitude, you will not get good through water imagery even if all the other factors are suitable. If the tide is too high for the water clarity conditions and depth of the eelgrass, you will not be able to detect the deep edge. There are other a few, also a few other moderately important factors, including the eelgrass patchiness and density, um, the wind speed, the cloud cover, and the non-eelgrass submerged aquatic vegetation density. And finally, the environmental conditions do appear to be more important than the site-specific characteristics for confident eelgrass mapping. Um, and that is typically because if you have good environmental conditions in which you can see um, through the water column and with good illumination of those background substrates, um, you can still produce fairly confident eelgrass mapping, even if it's fairly patchy with lots of other um, other submerged aquatic vegetation present. So thank you so much for having me. And that is all I have for you today. And it was a joy to talk to a bunch of other sun angle nerds today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Natasha. Uh, I hope you all will uh, join me in a virtual applause for Natasha on Teams. And I'm going to open up the floor for one to two questions. Um, it was, yeah, it was really great to have you here to present. We haven't yet had a presenter that uh, spoke about some of the challenges and tidally influenced systems. Um, so this is an added benefit to the group. So thank you again. Um, mm -hmm. I will look for questions. Anybody have their hand up or a question in the chat? All righty, let's see. Um, okay. Lynn, if you want to take the floor and ask your question or drop it in the chat. Yeah, hi. Um, I am curious about how you are enhancing your images before um, you're doing your classification, um, especially when you have a mix of like intertidal seagrass and uh, seagrass below the, at like at depth. Mm -hmm. um, there is no one way to go about the enhancements um, because pretty much every combination of water quality or water column parameters is going to make a special case. Um, but one thing that I really like using um, for uh, this type of imagery where you have really inconsistent reflection within the image um, is you have options in certain GIS software to um, apply your enhancement just to um, like the, the pixel values that are within view. Um, and that is really helpful um, because then you can dynamically explore your image um, without having to like you can you can explore this area where there's no cloud reflectance and then um, scroll over and be able to dynamically adjust that. Um, where you have um, like lots of cloud cover. Um, so that is super, super handy. Um, but there's, yeah, unfortunately not really a straight answer in terms of like which enhancements to use. Uh, Cause I've used everything under the sun. Um, and it really is just like image to image, which enhancements are gonna work best. Oh, good. That's what I've been doing. So that sounds <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. All right, great. Thank you for that question, Flynn. Is there anybody else in the audience that would like to ask Natasha a question? I think we have time for one more before we move on to our next presenter. All right, Tolly, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Natasha. That was a great presentation. Um, 
I'm just curious about the application of this. Um, I understand that this is kind of critical habitat for salmon, um, you know, entering the ocean, but would this be used to quantify the amount of seagrass? Is it um, a habitat that's being lost um, mm -hmm. or are you looking to conserve it? Kind of what is the application there? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Um, I was so excited to talk about like the nitty gritties of like cloud cover. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the big application, of course, of like this particular work is getting that really good imagery. Um, but what do you do with really good imagery? Um, Eelgrass is an indicator species in estuarine environments. So we do have a number of uh, marine monitoring programs that use eelgrass condition and extent as an indicator of cumulative effects in the marine environment. So like these methods are being applied to, for example, like we have a project up on the north coast um, where these eelgrass extent metrics that we're deriving from this imagery are being used um, to track cumulative effects. Um, which is a pretty cool application, um, especially because these data can be collected freely rapidly um, across a number of monitoring sites. And it's not super hard to actually do the analysis. Um, so we're able to train um, like First Nations technicians to monitor their own um, eelgrass meadows using these methods, which is pretty cool. Um, and then, of course, there's applications in uh, like restoration. So um, we've done a number of eelgrass restoration projects where uh, like all the baseline data is based on um, like these imaging methods. Um, so there's a couple, a couple applications. Awesome. Thanks again, Natasha. This is great. Um, I'm going to encourage anybody else that has lingering questions for Natasha to reach out to her via email or reach out to me to get in contact with Natasha. Um, and again, this video will be uploaded on YouTube. Um, but thank you again for agreeing to present. And I'm going to pass it over to our next presenters now. OK, so Amy, if you want to bring back up our slide deck. Okay, so our second group of presenters today are Tara Blackman and Tolly Mackey from Mount Hood Environmental, and they're going to be co-presenting today about Oregon Spotted Frog Habitat Suitability Monitoring in Central Oregon Watersheds. And with that, I'll pass it over to Tara. Hello, everyone. My name is Tara Blackman. Um, I'm an ecologist at Mount Hood Environmental. Today, my colleague Tully Mackey and I are, are going to be sharing our UAV-assisted habitat suitability monitoring work for the Oregon Spotted Frog. Um, this work, I just wanted to mention, was funded by the Deschutes Basin Board of Control and was conducted in partnership with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Slide, please. So I'd like to start just by giving a little bit of background um, and context about the Oregon spotted frog and their habitats. This is a highly aquatic frog. They have extensive webbing on their feet and they remain near water throughout their entire lives. Their historical range was from Southwest British Columbia to Northeast California. They've uh, since been extirpated from most of this historical range. And primarily this is due to the loss of about 70% of their habitat. And the majority of the extant populations are concentrated in the Deschutes Basin in Oregon. Um, you can see on this map on the right, the little black triangles represent that those extant populations. And in 2014, the Oregon spotted frog was federally listed as threatened throughout its range. And it's been on the sensitive critical list in Oregon since 1996. And it's also listed as endangered in Canada. Next slide. So the spotted frog has really specific habitat needs throughout their life cycle. Uh, for breeding, they need pools or backwater shallows. Often these are seasonally inundated. These have low or no flow. 
They have native emergent vegetation and often it's uh, matted down from the previous season like this picture you see on the right. And they have really high site fidelity. And this last point is really important because spotted frogs come back to the same locations year after year and potentially for generations. So restoring this habitat, improving the corridors between habitat and opening up new habitat is part of the goal for managers. Um, tadpoles are typically um, in areas that are connected to those breeding sites. They don't go too far. Um, these are moderately vegetated. Um, they're still in the water as that emergent vegetation starts to grow in, and they might have palustrian shrubs or forested habitat like this picture. Next slide. So the adults and post metamorphic frogs are hanging out in herbaceous wetland vegetation in pools, ponds, and other permanent water. Um, this photo is actually taken at one of the sites that we're going to talk about today. Um, and they overwinter in springs, beaver dams, shallow water streams, and below surface ice. And uh, some studies indicate that adults don't really travel very far between their breeding habitat and those overwinter habitats. So again, it's really important that um, there's connectivity between these different habitats that they're using throughout their life cycle. Next slide. So in Central Oregon, their habitat, like in many other places, has been highly affected by water management. So after about 12 years of negotiations, eight irrigation districts in the Deschutes Basin and the city of Prineville prepared the Deschutes Basin Habitat Conservation Plan. And this supports the issuance of an incidental take permit from Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMPS. And this incidental take permit allows them to utilize the waters of the Deschutes River and its tributaries where those activities might have potential to incidentally harm the spotted frog, steelhead trout, or bullhead trout. Um, all of which are currently listed under the ESA. So this, this document is implemented to minimize and mitigate the impacts of this authorized taking. And it's part of a larger regional effort to restore and enhance aquatic habitats for the covered species in the Deschutes Basin. And part of that effort is funding biologists to conduct Oregon spotted frog habitat suitability analyses. Next slide. So what is a habitat suitability analysis? Well, according to the HCP, this may include, but is not limited to, determining surface water elevations relative to floodplains, monitoring vegetation, including the, presen the presence of invasive reed canary grass, monitoring bullfrogs, and conducting drone flights. So this language is pretty vague. A lot of our challenge was defining monitoring parameters that are gonna have utility for habitat enhancement. So this map on the right shows the site that was eventually selected for our analysis. This is a large parcel of land owned by the BLM. It's in the Little Deschutes Basin, and it's in an area with an active floodplain. You can see on this image all of these old oxbows, many of which are still seasonally activated. And spotted frogs are actively using this off-channel habitat throughout the year. Um, there's many known breeding sites, and we see adults basically year-round here. Um, because of these features, this site was a good candidate for restoration opportunity. And uh, we're, we're going to be focused on those, uh, those white polygons. So our analysis had three major components to it that would get us some of those products that are outlined in the HCP. The first is UAV remote sensing to capture high resolution imagery. Second, vegetation surveys to map the community types and breaks in those selected habitats. And then photogrammetric processing and analysis to tie it all together. And the products that we're hoping to get that are going to assist with restoration and enhancement are mapping and delineating the vegetation community types, breaks, and relative elevations for known off-channel habitats identifying locations and total area of reed canary grass, um, which is an invasive that is problematic for the frog. And generally just to document the baseline conditions. So as flows change under the habitat conservation plan, we can see those changes in the, the corresponding changes in the vegetation. Next slide, please. 
So the vegetation surveys had several components, and the goal was to get a species inventory, particularly in these known high use areas. So to delineate the community types, we created polygons from both ground surveys and via aerial surveys. For the ground truthing, we used an Aero GNSS receiver with field maps, and we classified the plant association using keys provided in the riparian and wetland vegetation of central and eastern Oregon. And so this map on the right is showing these polygons that we created using on the ground surveys. So before I let Tully get into the nitty gritty details of the aerial surveys, um, I just wanted to stress the importance of ground truthing for a couple of reasons. So as I mentioned, the frog is really particular about their habitat. So we wanna know exactly what species they're utilizing. Um, this, in this particular region, they're really fond of sedges and these sedges are not easily differentiated from aerial imagery. So this photo on the right, we can easily see the standing water and aquatic vegetation in that pink polygon. And we can easily see the upland grasses above that white line but the dense carex on either side of that yellow line are actually two to three different species. And those required looking at cell walls and counting florets, um, which I'm doing in that upper left photo. But there are a lot of plant associations that were easy to identify from the aerial imagery, like the shrubs in this lower left image. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Tully and let him talk about the UAV details that you all came here to hear about. Thanks, Tara. Um, yeah, for the aerial surveys um, that we did of our project site, you know, we were hoping to get um, digital elevation model products and high resolution high resolution um, ortho mosaics of the um, survey areas. And so to do this, we used a DJI Phantom 4 Pro um, V2 with the standard red, green, blue uh, sensor. Um, we use the flight parameters of 80% uh, front overlap and 70% side overlap. We flew at an um, altitude of 100 feet to clear the tallest trees um, in our project site, uh, which provided uh, a resolution of 0 0.8 centimeters per pixel. And we flew at nadir, uh, meaning that our sensor was 90 degrees or um, perp perpendicular to the ground. Um, to geo-reference our aerial imagery, we used five ground control points at each site. Um, we placed one in each corner of our flight plan and then one point in the center of our um, survey locations uh, to tie that aerial imagery to the landscape. And we surveyed those in using a Trimble uh, GNSS receiver using um, real-time kinematic corrections um, from the Oregon real-time GNSS network. Um, after we collected our aerial imagery, um, we used Agisoft Metashape uh, Pro to post-process um, the images, and we used a pretty standard workflow. Uh, we brought our images in, we aligned the photos, uh, we then geo-referenced them with our ground control control point markers um, in our images, and then we built a sparse point cloud. Um, during this step, we did a couple iter iterations of optimization. So we removed points that had high um, reprojection error and high reconstruction uncertainty. And so after we removed those points, we built our um, dense point cloud. And then um, from there, we were able to build a digital surface model, which is a type of digital elevation model that, in addition to the ground, includes vegetation like trees or any other objects like buildings or um, cars. And from there, we wanted to um, eliminate um, as much of the vegetation as we could um, to get to kind of a bare earth model or a digital terrain model. And we did that in Metashape um, using a ground point classification process. And this process is a little bit of trial and error where you input some parameters to define your ground points, to define what are ground points and what are not. Um, and this can take a few, a few tries to um, 
get it as best you can. Um, and it's not a perfect solution. We were able to eliminate, um, you know, tall trees, our willows, our reed canary grass, and um, most shrubs. But we weren't able to eliminate um, areas of like thick grasses that really characterizes a lot of um, this habitat or this the survey area. And so um, we weren't confident that we were getting a true elevation um, in those locations. And that's why we uh, use the term uh, relative elevation. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, how we might address this in the future um, in some future slides. Um, so once we built our models, we um, evaluated how accurate they were. They are, um, and they were very accurate. This is our average um, X, Y, and Z coordinate error across all um, five sites, and our total error, um, which was under two centimeters, um, which was a, a very good resolution um, for this analysis, a finer resolution really than what we needed. So we were really happy with that, and um, we felt confident moving forward with using the those elevations um, for our analysis. Um, the next step was bringing in um, the digital terrain models and our um, vegetation community type polygons into QGIS. Um, we did a kind of a validation process there where we overlaid the um, polygons onto the um, digital terrain model to see how well our elevation breaks lined up with our vegetation community type breaks. And um, across all five sites, they, they lined up really well. Um, you can see from these images, um, the digital terrain model on the right, the areas of red represents lower elevation areas, and they correlate really well with the um, polygons that represent our wetland vegetation and areas that are used by the Oregon spotted frog. Um, from there, we did, uh, <clears throat> um, we summarized statistics for each site um, using the uh, field calculator and zonal statistic tools in QGIS. Um, this is an example of one of our sites where we calculated um, the average elevation for each uh, vegetation community type as well as the minimum elevation. Um, we also calculated the total area for each polygon. And then we also calculated the area of um, reed canary grass present in each um, vegetation community type polygon. Um, and then finally, we summarized our elevation data across um, all five sites to look at the um, vegetation topo sequence. And you can see here uh, a distinct elevation gradient relative to our um, vegetation community types. The, the dots in green represent the vegetation types that are used by the Oregon spotted frog, what we would consider suitable or critical habitat. And the black dots represent those community types that are um, not used by the Oregon spotted frog. And we can see here um, that the um, reed canary grass is found at a higher elevation than this suitable habitat and is really not encroaching um, on that suita suitable habitat currently. Um, this information could also be really useful for um, restoration, um, targeting uh, specific elevations for excavation or fill to create more um, suitable habitat for the Oregon spotted frog. Um, so moving forward with future research with this project um, to sort of tackle this uh, issue of relative elevation versus true elevation in these areas of thick vegetation. Um, one idea is to use our GNSS receiver to do some ground truthing and take a distribution of points in this environment um, to get a ground elevation and then compare it to our uh, elevations derived from our UAV imagery and compare to see if there are any differences. Um, and if there are differences and they're consistent, we might be able to develop a correction factor that we could then apply to our um, 
to our UAV uh, imagery elevation. Um, we also are looking into utilizing um, LIDAR data. If uh, it exists for the project area, we need to look into this, um, but that would be another way to sort of validate our UAV um, elevation data to uh, true bare earth data. Um, so to potentially monitor these sites over time and detect change, um, we are looking into using a change detection tool in the software cloud compare where we can compare um, point clouds from a site um, from surveys taken at two different times um, and what this does is uh, it looks it takes that point cloud so you're working with three-dimensional data and it uses an algorithm to look at um, points and how much they've changed in distance over time um, in that X, Y, and Z coordinate system. And this image here is, is not from this project, um, but I wanted to present it as an example. This is from a, another project I've been working on looking at um, erosion and deposition around wood structures in a river restoration project. And in this image, um, the red color represents erosion, where blue represents deposition, just to kind of give you an idea of what this, um, this analysis might look like. Um, and then another option too would be to use the digital terrain models um, from two different surveys and compare them in Metashape using a DEM of, of difference where you kind of subtract um, one uh, digital terrain model from another. Um, and then we would also like to uh, better understand this functional relationship between uh, river stage and vegetation health, as this also plays a role in the um, suitability of habitat for frogs. Um, and so we will be kind of investigating using um, soil moisture probes and a fluorometer. Um, along with using the UAV, um, looking at like leaf reflectance and um, vegetation indices to better understand vegetation health related to the um, stage of the river, the water surface elevation. And this inf information might be useful um, to just better understand how the, the hydrologic process of the river, the river stage um, influences uh, available suitable habitat. Um, and so with that, I um, would love to hear if people have suggestions on how we might improve our approach or if there are some different methodologies that might be applicable for this um, assessment. And uh, just wanted to thank you for your time and um, yeah, open it up to any questions you might have. Thank you again, Tolly and Tara. Um, one more round of applause, e applause for our presenters here before we launch into questions. All right, do we have any initial questions for Tara, Tolly, um, or feedback for improving their methods? And I have a couple of questions myself, so I'll launch in if, if nobody speaks up. Yeah, so you um, OK, I'm going to go ahead. So you kind of alluded to uh, your your additional plans down the line, and it sounds like there might be some some utility in multispectral or hyperspectral hyperspectral sensors um, to further like delineate the boundaries of, of vegetation communities and define soil moisture properties. Um, can you speak a little bit more about the challenges of mapping these like wetland environments where the water table might be high and there might be water everywhere. Um, I've only thought about this mostly from a river and stage zero restoration perspective of where do you define the boundaries of, you know, a given extent if there's standing water or if there's moisture. Um, and this is more so just like a wetland question. You guys could clarify that. Do you want to take that, Tara? I'm not sure about a well in extent. I, I'll just say that um, my experience and knowledge with multispectral imagery is pretty limited. Um, and I think there's a cost barrier there, at least for us and for our projects. Um, but we know that there's some similar work 
being done in in the the greater area that is leveraging multispectral imagery. I think Tara has a little more information on that, and I think it's um, producing some really good results and something that we're we're interested in. So uh, with that, I'll and let Tara speak to that. Thanks, Dolly. Yeah. I think one strategy that we used because this was kind of a one off assessment was to evaluate it at low at the lowest river stage. So um, so the standing water that was there that we knew that that was all permanent water and um, and so we could see the vegetation that had grown in around it. Um, something that I think would be more useful and we're intending to do in a future study is to um, revisit these sites throughout the year so that we can get these, we can map the wetlands at different stages. Um, but yeah, I think what Tully was describing, um, adding, adding some elements to our drone, um, particularly looking at, um, a thermal band or um, leaf reflectance. Yeah, there's there seems to be a lot of considerations. It's like you have cost, and then you also have to think about like you know the staff time and expertise for doing the analysis. And yeah, it's a, it could be an added benefit, but yeah, it'll require a lot more work um, to get there. Okay, any other questions from? Um, from the audience that's still on the call. Okay. All right, well, if there are no other questions for Tolly or Tara, um, same thing, I'll encourage you guys to, and those that are viewing this presentation later, reach out to them for advice and feedback um, on their, their future work. Um, and with that, I'll open up the floor to questions for either of our presenters. So if you have a question for Natasha um, or Tara or Tully, feel free to drop that in the chat and I can relay it if you're feeling shy. Um, okay, any other questions? We do have a couple other items, so please hang on the call if there are no other questions. Okay, quiet, quiet group today. Maybe let's, oh, we do have one question. Great. Uh, Dawn, go ahead. Yeah, hi there. Um, I'm curious for the spotted frog habitat. I, I, didn't, I didn't hear the very first part of it, so apologize if you mentioned this, but is the purpose um, to look at the all of the habitat in Washington, or in Washington State, sorry, you know where I'm from now, uh, from Oregon or, um, for that HCP work, or is this more going to be site specific for harvest units and planning um, for those under the HCP? I'm just kind of wondering about the scalability of this. Yeah, our work is focused on sites that are specific to the Deschutes Basin Habitat Conservation Plan, and the sites are picked by fish and wildlife. So these are sites that they have particular interest and are within the area that is impacted by the water management operations. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. so we, I mean, we we could do it anywhere. Um, but it, we have to we have to stick to what's outlined in the HCP. Right. I didn't. That was my mistake. I know that there's um, a statewide Oregon statewide adaptive management program and stuff that's just kicked up with a statewide HCP and forest practices. And so I didn't realize this is probably a separate from that. So a smaller area, which makes more sense why you're doing it with this methodology as opposed to satellites or something. Great. Thank you, Don. All right. Um, any other questions, lingering questions in the chat at this time? I'm not 
seeing any right now. So I'm going to move on to one final thing before we start closing out today's meeting. Um, OK, so this is just circling back to something that we've alluded to a couple of times and earlier in today's meeting. Um, later this week, uh, Amy and I are going to be launching an email discussion group through Google Group. Uh, we're hoping that this group will be an easier platform for sharing remote sensing resources, upcoming events, and a place to seek advice and form connections in, in the broader Pacific Northwest remote sensing community. Uh, so ahead of this launch, we wanted to poll the audience today on resources that you've found useful to date. And I'm actually going to join in because I have a couple of resources that I want to share with the group, but I'll also be sharing later this week um, when we launch. So. So yeah. Yeah, I didn't I, say yeah. the question, but what are some ways <laughs> that you can stay connected to the remote sensing community? Um, and we're really looking for resources beyond just scientific literature. And you can get to the poll. Yeah, you can get to the poll through the link I threw in the chat or with the QR code, or you can go to slido.com and enter the code RSF. Thanks, Amy. Right, and that's that's from Lauren. We talked about this earlier today. Yeah, I found this uh, this really cool podcast that's available on pretty much all podcast streaming applications: um, Spotify, Apple, um, social media. All right, Ian Forum. <laughs> And part of this is um, selfish motivation on my part. In preparation for our meetings, I, I tend to you know, scour social media and LinkedIn um, to find cool resources and nice figures and visualizations that we can add into our, our meeting um, to convey remote sensing topics in a more approachable way. Um, so there, there are ever any resources that you find, I encourage you to um, drop those to join, first off, the Google group and share those with the community or directly with Amy and myself. We have a couple others typing, so we'll, we'll give it a couple more minutes. And yeah, Amy, I don't know if you want to pitch. Um, there's a couple other PNAM forums um, that you can go and investigate yourself. But outside of the remote sensing forum, there's also a data visualization forum, um, which has been really helpful. Um, and you know, thinking about how people visualize data and is certainly relevant here. It's the yeah. So the group. yeah the um, the data viz group is a collaboration that we um, are engaged with the USGS Center for Data Integration, so the USGS CDI, um, and I'd be happy to connect you with them. Um, similar format, uh, you know, three to four webinars a year where we invite a speaker to talk about various aspects of data visualization. It's usually pretty tool agnostic, um, and it's, you know, more about, uh, I don't know, design and, um, Good elements of design and how to how to tell stories and convey messages. Um, and then we have the uh, emerging technologies information sessions that we are running typically every two years, and we're going to alternate between hybrid, like a hybrid conference style meeting, um, with a more webinar based uh, event where it'll be a, it'll be a series of webinars. So I think we just held the in-person conference in November of 22. So we're looking at winter of 24, 25 for our next ETIS uh, webinar series. Looks like we've had some more um, responses to the survey come in while I've been talking. This is great. This is helpful. Yeah, thank you all. OK, well, that was our last live polling question for this meeting. Um, I'll just open up the floor one final time. If you have any direct questions for Tolly, Tara, or Natasha, feel free to raise your hand or drop those in the chat. Um, and more broadly, if you have any, any questions or recommendations for the Remote Sensing Forum, this group here, or the broader audience, um, 
we have a couple minutes, then yeah, we can entertain those um, or just end the meeting early and give you about 15 minutes. Guessing it's going to be the latter. Uh, <laughs> any final any final <laughs> thoughts, Amy? Yeah, sure. I'll wrap up the meeting. So um, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, thanks for sticking around to the very end. I'm going to send an email out uh, by the end of this week with a link to the meeting and information about how to join the email discussion group. If you're not on the distribution list, but you want to be, send me an email. Uh, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. So uh, if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out to Lauren or I um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Lauren.